So thanks for coming. Um, I just woke up this morning with a sore throat, so bear with me. If you don't understand something, just let me know. So um, my talk today is uh, about data frames and when they fail, what you, what you should do. And um, basically, uh, how, this, how did this talk happen is uh, that um, I was working with a client on building a, a basically a snapshot of all the, the historical data. But um, the idea was to build a complex relational data model and for any change in the relational data model to build a new snapshot. So it got pretty complex uh, in the sense of uh, the, the output data model, but the logic was fairly simple. So collecting all the timestamps, building the snapshot, and storing everything in the database. But uh, the idea was to store, to, to store everything into Cassandra and to have one read per uh, version, version or timestamp-based time snapshot, and then to have the writes, uh, the reads as fast as possible. Sorry. So uh, this basically explained like this high-level explanation doesn't sound complex, and the solution sounds easy, especially since I already had a Spark deployment. So it was no-brainer to start with uh, ex experimenting with Spark, and that's how I got to the first and initial uh, logical solution, that uh, logically correct solution, that gave me a, a nice overview of what needs to be done and uh, a pretty good and decent uh, proof of concept implementation. But, but looking at uh, how it all happened, okay. But looking at how it all happened, and when you build a, a pretty complex structure in Spark, Spark doesn't like uh, uh, structs and collections inside of the fields, and that became, becomes pretty complex. And uh, as you can see, the output schema of, uh, of the data frame, the resulting data frame basically gave me uh, over 2,000 lines um, in the three, sch three schema outputs. So it was a pretty complex data model, uh, not just a matter of the number of fields per entity, it was more of a, a pretty uh, nested structure. I think the numbers were nine deep and 11 wide uh, nested structure, so it became pretty complex. And uh, doing something like this in Spark basically uh, gave me an option of uh, multiplying results uh, to get the uh, everything into a single flat uh, data frame. But if you uh, get to the number of four, uh, 40 million entities of an output, uh, by multiplying each, uh, each entity on each level will, would give me a, a huge number, and that's something that uh, Spark couldn't handle at all. So I would just like to get uh, over the logically correct and correct implementations. This is something I'm, I'm constantly uh, talking about with my data scientists, is that uh, logically correct uh, implementation is basically a, a solution that gives you, uh, gets you through the data analysis process, uh, data exploration, exploration phases. Of course, the idea is to get the correct output as soon as possible. So once you go through the, this phase, you should get uh, an idea of what the output is going to be or try to match the required out output and validate this result. <coughs> and one of the things that uh, actually was a good thing and a bad thing was running this uh, algorithm and implementation on a subset. The subset data was fairly small and uh, it was pretty good for quick iteration. And uh, running on a subset tends, tends to eliminate the, any kind of data issue that you have, so you don't, you don't have to worry about that. But the problem of running on the subset of data was that once I started running on the full data set, of course, all possible problems were uh, coming up. So. Of course, the, the second part of the process was much harder. That's basically getting to a correct a solution which has the same correct result, but has a repeatable perf performance. Uh, repeatable performance was something that we were targeting from the start because uh, this was supposed to be a process that needs to be reran almost daily, and uh, it needs to be scaled, uh, scalable and optimized. And of course, there's some data handling that we needed to implement, so uh, this is where actually the pain <laughs> Begin. So let's dig in. Uh, if we're talking about uh, Spark and how Spark distributes data and how Spark uh, consumes data from different data sources, of course, there's a huge notion of data partitioning and how the partitions are being uh, distributed. And of course, uh, is any, anybody here using Spark? And uh, is anybody using the JDBC to read from the relational database? Okay, so not too many people. But, uh, if you are, you probably understand what the problem with this is. 
So if you just uh, use the Spark ReJDBC and uh, give it the connection properties to any kind of relational database, it will most likely read all the data into one partition, even though it will create as many partitions as you, uh, is, uh, is you defined. And uh, that this, was, this was the first problem that you, I mean, you'll always encounter. So the idea behind uh, optimizing this is that uh, data is being partitioned properly in the, in the querying from, uh, from the data source. And uh, by this, uh, you need to specify the column name for the proper distribution. Usually this column name is, uh, um, um, <coughs> sorry, usually this column name is a field that you're going to join the other data, uh, data frames on. And in that way, you can keep the data partitioned properly throughout the workers. And then when the joins are happening, they're, they're happening either inside the same JVM, inside the same process, or on the same worker. So there's uh, almost no uh, data shuffling throughout the cl cluster. Of course, the number of partitions defines the parallelism. Uh, how many output partitions is the resulting RDD or the data frame going to have? And one of the things that uh, is basically a constraint by, a constraint by uh, when you define the col column name uh, is uh, are these bounds. Uh, getting to the bounds uh, is easy because you can always fire up a single query with um, selecting uh, min and max of, uh, of this field column that you're basically specifying and then just uh, enter that into, into a query. And uh, these, uh, these queries are pretty fast because it's a, it, it's a push down and the query is being executed in, in the relational database. So and this is an example how, how it looks. And um, I think that this preparation is uh, important in order to get the source data properly distributed and then any kind of operation down the road uh, becomes uh, less expensive. And of course, the... Just give me a second. Is it thinking or, yeah. Okay, something happened. So um, the, the next thing, once, once you load the data, uh, the next thing is, pro well, of course, the repartitioning. Uh, Repartitioning tends, tends to be expensive, but this is an operation that if done correctly and if done in the early stages and if you're partitioning, as I said, for example, you're partitioning by a, uh, a, a join uh, field, then this is something that can uh, pay off uh, down, down the road. So for example, there's two ways you can repartition the data. You can just do a standard shuffle with the number of partitions that you want, or you can repartition by a number of uh, partition and the column expression, this can be a one or mul multiple columns, and basically this gives uh, a hint to the, uh, to the partitioner how the data is going to be distributed throughout the, throughout the cluster. Of course, there's a second operation that's co uh, this is the This has the narrow dependency, which means that, for example, if you, if you have a, 100 partitions per worker and you coalesce to, I don't know, 10 partitions per worker, these 100 partitions will get merged inside one worker and there'll be no data shuffling throughout the network. So this is something that um, is usually used to lower down the number of partitions and it can, can help a lot if, for example, the resulting uh, data frame has too many partitions or it gets too complex. It can help, uh, it, it can help with that. So repartition basically, as I said, uh, try to partition by join field as, soon, as, as much as you can because uh, Using the same hash partitioner will make sure that all the data partitioned by the same join field will end up on the same node. Uh, repartitioning is expensive, and of course, if you do it early, it can help down the road a lot. And uh, I just explained the difference between a coalesce and repartition. And of course, uh, there's a default uh, hash, per hash partitioner. So if you're partitioning by a, f by a field, it calculates a hash and then um, distributes data by that. And of course, uh, what I usually do is uh, having the number of partitions divisible, divisible by number of cores. Um, I think that documentation says it's something between two and three, but uh, usually 10 times the number of cores in the system is, is an okay start. And uh, the next thing that uh, is also really important when doing these, this kind of work and uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, minimize the, the issues in the, the Spark application is, of course, looking at the data locality. 
Um, all these repartitioning and reading from the different data sources and actually doing any kind of joins, uh, shuffle joins, cross joins, whatever you're doing, uh, basically is impacted by where the data is. So uh, tasks are usually being uh, serialized, sent to where the data is, but if the, the data, for, uh, for, for example, left or the right data frame uh, being joined is on another worker, then that data needs to be sent through the network. And of course, uh, process locally is the best thing because it's, it's in the same JVM. Node locally is uh, the data that's on the same node, so there's no network overhead. Um, and of course, no preference uh, is the no locality preference. Basically, any node in the system can uh, access the, the data in, uh, in the same, with the same performance. Of course, once you start debugging this, and once you start looking into Spark UI, the, if you see any, uh, that means that the data is not on the executors, and it usually uh, takes the longest path to get to the data. And uh, these are some of the things that uh, you should look for if, you, if you're looking for performance joins. And this is how it looks, it looks like when you drill down the Spark UI. Uh, this is just an example with the process local data uh, locality and for example, the, the next thing that uh, it's also important is the work distribution. Um, I'm not talking about uh, doing a lot of work on the driver itself. I'm talking about uh, not properly writing the code so that there's a lot of work that being executed on one worker where the other workers are waiting for that result or any other reason. Uh, this is how you can see that on the Spark UI. Uh, you can see that uh, there's uh, uh, six cores, basically six ta tasks can be executed at the same time, and there's only one worker and one task running at this point in time, and so uh, you should execute, the, uh, you should uh, examine this stage and see what's causing this issue because uh, it means that 99% uh, of your cluster is uh, basically doing nothing and you're waiting for uh, only this one task to complete. Proper work dis distribution, the same, uh, in the same, uh, Deployment would look uh, like this. So you have six cores. All cores are active and all cores are running tasks. And this is something that gives you pro the best results and the best performance. Uh, and as I said, um, this is the screen that uh, shows uh, how the work is being distributed. And of course, there's uh, so, uh, other details like uh, task time, GC time, total tasks, and RDD blocks being run through these uh, executors. So. Um, of course, um, when you start doing these, these uh, kind of joins and different kind of joins uh, that require um, shuffling, one of the things that you should look into is uh, broadcasting variables. Broadcasting variables basically keeps a copy of uh, uh, data on all the uh, workers. Um, and this is something that I, I usually do with small data sets when I need to uh, cross join on jo or join the small data set with a bigger data set. I want to make sure that the small data set, if needed, is being broadcasted uh, instead of broadcasting the, uh, the bigger data set because that's gonna give us a lot of uh, network overhead and we ha will have to wait for that. And um, basically this uh, broadcasting variables reduces the size of a serialized, a serialized task because then the task doesn't contain the data uh, and the data is on the worker already. And broadcasting variables is something that's uh, usually used, for example, when you have uh, some kind of data being collected to the driver uh, and then this data has to be used on all the, all the workers, on all the partitions, especially applying map, map partition functions. And this is usually true for the machine learning when you apply the model to all the data. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there's an automatic threshold for, uh, for the certain data size where Spark just broadcasts it anyways. And uh, as I said, this is something that I use to optimize join operations when I see that there's, uh, there's enough room for a broadcasting variable without too many additional expenses. And uh, the, the next thing that uh, I tried, for example, to reduce the, um, the execution graph lineage is to um, do checkpointing. Uh, checkpointing is pretty good because uh, it re resets the lineage graph and if, and if it's too complex, uh, Spark doesn't like complex uh, lineage graphs. It just truncates it and it basically you're start, starting from uh, fresh. And there's two types of uh, checkpointing. Um, excuse me. So uh, there's two types, types of checkpointing. Of course, there's uh, reliable checkpointing. And uh, this is uh, good uh, to um, leverage the HDFS storage. It needs to have the HDFS storage uh, target for 
the reliable checkpointing, and it's set in the Spark context or in the configuration as a set checkpoint here. So uh, the idea with this is that if the task fails uh, and if, if you have a successful checkpoint, you can restart from that point, and that's why the, uh, the distributed checkpoints are good when you have a complexity in your application. And of course, the second one is the local checkpoint. This is something that you can use as an optimization of the lineage graph, because once you do a local checkpoint, uh, the data is, is basically stored in the local temp, uh, temp storage, but you can uh, drop the lineage graph and you can um, start fresh from that point because you're not gaining more complexity. But the downside to this is that if the task fails, it needs to recalculate everything from the start. Um, <coughs> so how do you get to these, um, how do you get to these uh, improvement points? Of course, uh, first thing and the thing that's free always is uh, the Spark, Spark Web UI. Uh, this is something that you should start leveraging as much as possible before you get into any kind of uh, metric collection because uh, the UI is pretty, pretty intuitive and you can uh, basically um, uh, debug almost, almost any problem. Um, there's a Spark History server. server. Is anybody using Sp uh, Spark History server? So um, the, the thing with Spark History Server uh, is basically you can uh, look into the metrics and you can look into the, all the stages and tasks uh, after the fact. So um, it and the Spark History Server will uses the local uh, logs. Uh, of course, you can um, collect the JSON metrics over the REST API. This is something that's interesting if you have any kind of API scrapers for collecting the metrics. And basically the same metric that you see in the UI is being exposed over the REST API. And uh, the last thing that uh, it's usually good in, the, in uh, for example, graphing some of the important metrics is collecting the metrics uh, because Spark uh, uses the drop wizard, it's pretty easy, or you can collect it over JMX. And you can use any of the already implemented things like graphite and then just graph on the Grafana. So one more thing that I uh, always look at when there's some kind of a problem is the event timeline. Uh, this basically tells you what, what kind of a schedule delay you had, uh, what, what's the execution uh, time, uh, computing time, and in the end, uh, which is also important, is uh, re result serialization time. So if you have a result that needs to be serialized, uh, this is where you, you look at the uh, um, latency. And of course, uh, the event timeline, can, if look at, looked at the highest level, can actually show you how many uh, workers joined and when they joined the, uh, the computing. Uh, one of the things that uh, will help you understand the RDD partitioning and if the data is being partitioned properly is the storage tab. So uh, this tab is usually empty, but once you start caching the data uh, or once you start uh, having these RDDs persisted, you'll see all the list of the, uh, of the RDDs and their state. So you can see that, uh, for example, these RDDs are all cached in four partitions. Uh, it's 100% fraction cached, and you can see the sizes in memory and on disk. And for example, if you drill down into the UI, this is something that uh, can easily show you that there's, some, there, there's a problem with uh, data, uh, data partitioning or the data distribution. You can see that here we have three workers and one is the driver. <coughs> the fourth one is the driver. And only two workers have uh, the data in this RDD. And this is uh, basically standard for any kind of JDBC data source if you don't uh, properly part partition the data. So. Uh, this is pretty detailed uh, um, work that uh, takes a lot of time and any kind of uh, optimization uh, in, in, in a pretty complex uh, uh, Spark application takes a lot of time. But then again, what happens if it all fails? I mean, uh, I got to the point where I sp spent almost two months on, on uh, working all, on all kinds of optimizations, but I still couldn't get the repeatable performance or the performance that was something that we were looking for. And uh, basically, I had to rethink uh, the implementation because the, the graph complexity was too much for Spark. And whenever you do this kind of nested structures in Spark, it usually tends to get to the, uh, the uh, over-complex uh, lineage. So if you think about what actually Spark is, it's an analytics 
engine for large-scale large data processing, but what's more important is that it's a cluster computing framework. So when you leverage that, uh, basically it, you're leveraging all the, all, all the um, good pro, pro, all the pros of the, of the distributed computing framework, but you need to do more work. So let's try and, and think about how this can be used. And of course, one of the things that uh, you can always, always leverage in these situations is uh, the map partition function. Uh, the map partition function is uh, um, uh, pretty easy to understand because it gives a, a function, you, you pass it a function which uh, has an iter iterator as an input and iterator as an output. And um, this is something that can help a lot with these problems, but I'm saying that this help me, it's not gonna help everybody and it, it tends to get the code more complex because you need to write everything yourself. But there's two types of map, map partition functions. There's one that uh, just uh, received the iterator to iterator output and then there's the other one which also has an index. So for example, there was a talk this morning about uh, indexing the partitions and applying machine learning. So this is a function that you use in that, in that case where you get an index of each partition and then you apply the functionality of, uh, of your custom implementation or, or the library. And uh, of course, this is an example how it all um, went down to map partition uh, function being applied, uh, custom, custom code being applied by, uh, in a map partition function, and this is an example. So for example, uh, for a bunch of partitions, um, I collected a, a number of IDs. These IDs are basically a root entity IDs. And then I applied a functionality that basically built the whole uh, relational tree, collected all the data, processed the data, and then saved the output to, uh, to a database. And of course, I just returned the iterator because I didn't care about changing the RDD because that was the functionality I was looking for. But if you apply any kind of functionality that uh, basically changes the, uh, the, uh, the, the RDD that you're working on, you return the iterator of the new uh, of the new changed RD and, and that's it. So um, there are also other usages to this. Uh, I, I think the documentation is pretty scarce and how it works internally, but there's other usages, for example, applying uh, custom processing code like I did, uh, running any kind of an ML pipeline. So for example, if you train the model on the driver, then the driver in the pipeline implementation gets uh, so, uh, sorry, the model in the pipeline implementation gets distributed to all the partitions, and that's how it's being applied. Uh, using any kind of third-party libraries, uh, this is something that uh, you usually see in data science. They have these uh, uh, third-party libraries deployed to all the workers and then being used, uh, you leveraging this map partition functionality or any, any other way you think about it. Uh, and uh, of course, what were the numbers? Why, why did this and uh, why, what were the results? So if we're talking about the data source as a source, it wasn't a big amount of data. It, I think it was around 10 gigs, so it's nothing. But the thing is that once you apply the algorithm, it basically uh, explodes into uh, more than 120 gigs of data. And especially with the complexity and nested data structure, it, it, it was pretty hard on Spark. And you might ask why I didn't implement it in, a, in any other framework, distributing uh, distributed framework. The thing is, was that uh, Spark was already there. I did a proof of concept and basically uh, once I uh, validated the output result and tried to do all these kind of uh, uh, optimizations, I just transferred the code and ran it to Spark anyways. So um, looking at the numbers, um, the results were pretty astonishing. Uh, the processing time dropped from 96 hours to about three and a half hours for the full data set. And uh, this is something that we were looking for. We were looking for anything under 12 hours because the idea was to run this job daily. And uh, dropping to 90, from 96 to three and a half hours is about 28 times faster. Um, adding new entities uh, didn't significantly impact complexity or, or the performance. This is something that I initially saw in, in the initial implementation using just the data frames. And uh, adding any kind of new entity tends to uh, uh, deteriorate performance and then you need to optimize, for example, the shuffle partitions, the, the parallelism or whatever you need to do just to accommodate the new complexity and uh, to make it run. The thing with the 96 hours initial running time was, uh, was not stable. 
So that's one of the reasons why uh, we did the conversion. And basically, we gained the uh, additional control for leverage, uh, for which we leverage down the road for any for another implementation, another logic, additional logic, whatever we needed. And the good thing is that we managed to use all the resources in the cluster. But uh, what's the con to this? Yeah, we managed to use all the resources in the cluster. Basically, CPU was maxed out. Uh, even though the memory performance, uh, memory consumption was a bit lower, the CPUs were uh, burning, and uh, we raised the code complexity. So this is something that um, is uh, the con of this solution is basically you need to implement a lot of work yourself in order to apply that uh, with this approach, and then uh, this is compared to the data frame approach, uh, more complex, but we managed to get the results that we were looking for, and that's the only thing that matters. Okay, are there any questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, yeah. Can you give some uh, intuition why map partitions work, worked so uh, much faster for you, like uh, as opposed to, for instance, just uh, map? Yes. Yeah, so the implementation when I uh, when I moved the implementation from the standard data frames uh, and uh, running transformations on the data frames, I implemented the the, the whole logic in, in pure Scala code. And once that is being uh, applied to, the, to all the whole partitions of data, I can actually have a chunk of data instead of just mapping each, each ID. So I, I, can, I can process a, a chunk of 1,000 IDs at the same time. And for example, if you, if you look uh, at how the implementation is, I could run uh, a SQL query for the 1,000 IDs at the same time. So I wouldn't run a thousand SQL queries, I would run one SQL query for a thousand IDs. So that also optimized the performance and the execution time because uh, instead of running 10,000 queries, I just ran 100 queries per partition uh, to the SQL database. And I think we maxed out the SQL database at one point, so we had to work with indexes and um, analyze the, pro the problems, but uh, yeah, th that's, the re that's the answer. So uh, the, the relational model was extremely complex, and once you start writing that as, as a tree structure and uh, uh, executing these functions on each entity going down, down the tree, it uh, multiplies and basically you, you, you're executing too many queries on the SQL. And that's something that I wanted to, uh, in some shape or form, control and optimize. Okay, uh, I understand. Would you um, still recommend using map partitions over map if you execute just your own code, like just your function and there's no uh, uh, SQL queries uh, happening inside? That depends. That, is, that depends because if you run a map partition on a bigger number of, for example, IDs on a bigger number of entities, that means that you're processing bigger number of entities at any given point in time instead of going one by one. And uh, that depends on, for example, your resources on the nodes, how, many mem how much memory do you have, what kind of operations are you running, do you need more than one or, or you don't, or you have better performance running the, uh, the batch instead of one by one. So um, I have a question concerning the local checkpointing. So I, I played around with that, the local checkpointing. Okay. Uh, so I played around with that, um, with, with data frames in this context, not with RDDs, and I uh, couldn't uh, um, really make a performance difference to, uh, to just persisting to disk. Right. I mean, basically, this is what happens when, when you checkpoint, you persist to disk, and you truncate the lineage graph. Uh, and, and you also have to cache it, right? because it, otherwise it computes it twice. But I thought this Sorry, can you repeat? You also need to, I didn't hear you. You have to cache it first, okay. right? Because it, otherwise it computes it twice, right? So, okay. it's, uh, uh, so given all that, uh, I thought still with iterative uh, algorithms, I would, might have a performance boost because of this truncating of the lineage graph, but it didn't seem to make a difference to just persisting it on disk. So uh, did you uh, actually uh, uh, see some performance increases there with, with uh, local checkpointing? Uh, 
Um, so, did you have some? Did you do some measurements or have some okay. data, okay. There, insights? There? Thank you. So, if I understood the question correctly, did I see any performance uh, from doing checkpointing? And uh, in contrast to, to, to just persisting, yes. Once the graph gets too complex, uh, you get the, the 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 performance impact that it actually can run to the end because when it's too complex, it just sorry, but it poops out. And uh, in in the in the cases where you you don't need to do any kind of checkpointing in that sense to uh, to truncate the lineage graph, I, I don't know how complex. Uh, your lineage graph, graph was, but this was ex extremely complex. And the thing is that uh, usually just persisting the data work, or there's also a second trick uh, I didn't mention in the talk, you can just save it to Parquet file, because that's, that's pretty quick. And once you save it to Parquet file, load it again, then it's, it's brand new. And you can also apply partitioning, additional partitioning on that, and so on and so on. No more questions? Uh, I did not quite get why you had to run like thousands of queries from inside one partition. Can you explain it again? So that's one question. And the other question, I don't get why you went for, um, for Spark in first place. Have you considered like using Kafka for the message delivery? Yeah, um, well, as I said, uh, I'll, I'll start with the second question first. The second question was, why did I use Spark? The Spark was already there, so I had the distributed computing already deployed. And uh, the, uh, I was using Spark initially to write the proof of concept. And I already have a lot of had a lot of uh, functionality implemented, so just switching to another technology would be just an additional work. And I think that in the end, uh, to think about it, looking at the end result, I would probably start with something different. For example, like, uh, like Akka or anything that, that, that's distributed, I can, I can leverage multiple instances without any effort. And uh, what was the first question? The, the multiple IDs, right? So yeah, so um, the first question was, uh, why did I query for multiple IDs? So uh, I co uh, created a, a code, basically I con my, the concept of the code was to have a thousand root entities, which proved to be a, an, an okay batch number, and then uh, all the other child entities would have similar or more because it's a one-to-many relation. But querying the, uh, any of these entities would basically be a select in and then uh, provided with a list of uh, IDs. I can say that it would be, uh, it, it might have been faster or the same uh, speed if it was running for the same, for one batch. But the thing is that I was running uh, 60 or 80 tasks at any given point in time and then just querying that much, uh, qu uh, querying that much queries to the same SQL database. It, I wasn't sure about the, the performance and this gave me a better, um, so there was a, the second part of the implementation that was actually storing into the database and having this batch of data actually uh, helped me optimize the, the writes uh, into the database also. So it, it gave me a, a pretty good uh, trade-off in the, in the overall performance. Okay, so well, thank you, Matija, for the okay. presentation and thank you all for coming. Uh, for those who, of you who are staying, there's gonna be a get-together with barbecue and beers at the Palais if you want to stay, and that's all for today. Thank you. <laughs>